This movie is great. I love the music. The acting is good. Some of the acting seems corny and fake. I never met anyone that was as wacky as the lonely man that stalks a man because he wants him to be his friend. About a year after my first experience with Jim Carrey's magical face, I was with my parents in a department store playing with the interactive store map screen when I noticed there was an option to watch trailers for upcoming films. The Cable Guy was one of those films. I remember repeatedly watching the trailer to a dark film I would never be allowed to watch in the cinema. As with most Jim Carrey films, the only memory I have of the trailer is a catchphrase. Carrey's ponomous character shouting Carbagiri in his distinctive annoying way, albeit not annoying at all to any at the time. Cable Guy poster Jim Carrey from the movie poster. Not very Carrey-like at all. The film doesn't tend to be considered one of Jim's early comedy classics because, well, for one thing, it wasn't treated too kindly when it first came out. Maybe you've not even heard of it, despite being a childhood fan of his early work. Jim's role in this film, directed by comic actor Ben Stiller, Zerlander, Tropic Thunder, is that of an eccentric stalker who craves friendship, and the change of tone from nonsensical to dark was apparently not something that most people wanted to see from Jim. Critics were similarly divided. Although it was included in the late veteran film critic Roger Ebert's Worst of the Year list for 1,996, his colleague Gene Siswell called it a very good film. Carries, best since The Mask. Hmm, funny that. I completely agree with Siskel. Having said that, I feel that unlike The Mask, which was strengthened by Jim Carrey playing the role that he was made for, the cable guy is good almost in spite of Jim. Someone else could probably have played Ship the Cable Guy, in fact, originally Stiller himself was set for the role, without losing too much from the film. I couldn't help but feel that maybe the film would have gotten more of the recognition it deserved without the expectations of a Jim Carrey comedy that had been firmly cemented with his triple whammy of films two years prior, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber. And, as it happens, when my friend looked at reviews of The Cable Guy, they did seem to be more and more favorable the more recent the review. Separate the film from that era and it's much easier to view the film on its own merits, which are not bad at all. Cable guy creepy Jim has chipped the cable guy may be just me, but I do feel that regardless of whether our friend Jim was a perfect fit for chip the cable guy, Stiller did use him in a way that worked. Unlike other early Carrie films set in the real world, the normal characters around Jim react realistically to his over-animated performances. They seem weirded out and uncomfortable, but too polite to break social mores and just run the hell away from him. When separated from the context of an oversaturated Jim Carrey market, his usual antics take on an interesting and wicked twist within the context of the film itself. Cable Guy Reaction A typical reaction to Chip's antics in The Cable Guy There is much interplay between the real world and the world of television in The Cable Guy, and in this sense, Jim Carrey playing his usual cartoon character works, because Chip admits to the protagonist Stephen, played by Matthew Broderick, that television was the only friend he had growing up. His chip emulating the larger-than-life performances he sees as a coping mechanism, as the only way he knows to interact with others. The satirical elements of the film are potentially strengthened by the stark contrast between what is acceptable in the land of the television set and what is taboo in the real world. In this film are several standout scenes that I truly believe could have been seen as classic comedy moments, had the cable guy been more successful. Chip playing basketball, with bonus young Jack Black cameo. Chip doing his own background music during a fight at a medieval theme restaurant with Steven, with bonus Star Trek impressions. Chip doing his impression of Jefferson Airplane at a karaoke party, with bonus erotic face massage. Where a lot of the film had me smiling in that way you smile when you see how a good film is coming together, or when you recognize the satirical elements of a movie with a dark message, these three scenes had me laughing out loud, and it's worth noting that these were all very quintessentially Jim Carrey moments. Ben Stiller is a great comic performer in his own right, but I can't see him writing scenes describing action quite like this. The performances spring naturally from Jim, and it feels like he was let off his leash for these scenes, which incidentally ended up being the scenes I remember most vividly from the film. I mentioned earlier that The Cable Guy is a good movie almost in spite of Jim Carrey, but would it have been as memorable? I honestly don't know. While I watched, I also found myself echoing at the cameos of several comic actors in their early careers. Besides a young Jack Black, comedy rock band Tenacious D, School of Rock, I saw maybe five seconds of David Cross, Mr. Show, Arrested Development, making a surprised face, and apparently his frequent collaborator Bob Adenkirk, Mr. Show, Breaking Bad, is in there too. Ben Stiller's frequent co-star Owen Wilson, Zerlander, The Royal Tenenbaums, pops in as his usual sleeves but, and, another frequent collaborator and amazing comic actor Jane and Goro follow, Mystery Man, Wet Hot American Summer, gets a cameo as a waitress. 
oh, and Andy Dick, whatever. It was fascinating to see all those familiar faces joining forces as tiny, tiny supporting roles in what probably would have been a favorite for a friend. The film itself is not perfect. All two women approaching anywhere near characters in The Cable Guy are glorified cameos and play as flat caricatures of what a man who doesn't know how to write women characters thinks a woman character is, and exist purely for the saga of furthering the plot because God forbid our main man be gay, Bruce. Also, why does Steven only get angry at Chip after he finds out the woman he slept with had been paid for by Chip? Of all the things that he could have been mad about, somehow Stiller felt that what would cross the line and end the relationship would be Steven sleeping with a prostitute while believing it was actually a one-night stand, is there some 90s cultural paradigm that I'm not getting here? My friend also felt that several scenes could have been a bit shorter without impacting the rest of the film, and I'd probably agree with her there. However, at least I can actually remember the plot to this movie, that's a first for this Jim Carrey honor. Again, as with The Mask, I find myself able to talk about elements of the cable guy that I like or don't like which are not strictly related to Jim Carrey's performance or character. Maybe that's what makes these two early Carrey films enjoyable for me as an adult.